It was an attack so strangely motivated yet callous that it left the nation of South Korea in a sense of shock and despair. And in October 2008, Jong Sang-jin's reprehensible actions claimed the lives of six innocent people. Despite a clear motive left behind in his diaries, those he targeted had nothing to do with the people he felt had wronged him. So, why did all of this happen? What caused him to finally snap? And what can we learn from all of this? Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, folks, and welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. My name is Adrian, and today we're looking at the case of Jong Sang Jin. Before we begin, and just to let you know that I post solved, unsolved, and strange cases here on a weekly basis. So if that sounds like a kind of thing, please consider subscribing to the channel. All right, let's dive straight into today's case, folks. So please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Jong Sang Jin. Today we're venturing to the Far East, and more specifically, to the southern half of the Korean Peninsula. So without further ado, welcome to South Korea folks, and let me tell you, there is a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to this nation. Now, unfortunately, it's pretty famous for having one of the most heavily militarized borders in the world, which of course it shares with its northern counterpart, North Korea. But there is so much more positivity to refer to when it comes to the nation. For example, South Korea seems to manage to blend ultra modern cities with jaw dropping geography quite perfectly. Plantations sprawl across the rolling countryside, striking cliff faces ripped through the coastline, and temples and rivers are scattered throughout the land. But the real fascination, at least for me, comes when you step into the city of Seoul. This place is absolutely unbelievable, to say the least. With a population of 10 million residents, this city still maintains its position as one of the best cities to live in, with the highest quality of life. And this means that Seoul is extremely popular, all while remaining tremendously fruitful. Its economy primarily focuses on advanced manufacturing, technology, finance, and commerce. And as you can likely imagine, all of these industries continuously exceed expectations and worldwide standards when it comes to modern practice. With an average salary of $40,000 per capita, living in the big city does come at a premium, however. And unfortunately, this means that there is somewhat of a wealth divide too. Seoul's top one percentile makes around 250 million won per year, which is equivalent to $200,000 or £160,000. Now, those fortunate enough to be making this kind of money can expect luxury in the heart of the city. However, for every affluently wealthy person, there are unfortunately a dozen others living in poverty. Life at the bottom of the societal food chain is tough, and can cause many feelings of anguish and resentment. And one of those individuals experiencing this hardship was a man named Jong Sang Jin. Sang Jin was a middle-aged man living in the Gangnanggu ward of Seoul. Aside from an internationally recognized and catchy viral song, Gangnam was well known for its gleaming skyscrapers, dazzling nightclubs, and generally modern high-end vibes. Literally meaning south of the river, Gangnam is home to many large companies like Google, Toyota, and Hyundai, meaning that property here is mind-bogglingly expensive. And combined with its neighboring districts of Seocho and Songpa, the three districts account for 10% of the entire country's land value. But these surroundings of wealth and glamour did not impact Sang Jin, who, unfortunately, was a man who barely owned anything. And although he resided in Gangnam itself, it was in a four-story building known as a Gosawan. Now, Gosawans are unique to Korea, and since they are so important to our case today, you will probably need to learn a little bit of backstory to them. Dominantly described as a low-cost lodging facility, Gosawan are a kind of single-room occupancy found throughout South Korea. Now, those of you who are students may familiarize with this, but bathrooms and kitchens tend to be shared, and the rooms are generally around 2 by 2 meters. They were originally designed for students to live in during their exam periods, which is not too dissimilar to some university halls found here in the UK. But in the 1990s and early 2000s, their popularity skyrocketed as demand for cheap lodging facilities became more crucial. This was due to an explosion in house prices, an increase in national divorce rates, an influx of foreign workers, and government initiatives designed to reduce rates of homelessness. And sadly, this is why Sangjin lived here. The man was barely scraping a living through part-time jobs, sometimes working as a food delivery driver and sometimes as a valet parking attendant. 
Although not much is known about Sang John's history, we do know that he grew up in Hapcheon, which is a county found far to the south of Seoul. Born in the year 1978, he moved to Seoul in 2002 at the age of 24. But by this time, he'd already endured what he called life-altering experiences. You see, Sang Jin believed that he had been persecuted as a child, and was ignored by many of his family and friends as he grew up. To be honest with you, it's not known what he meant by that, but those in his school remember him to be an awkward loner who was sometimes subjected to bullying. After attempting to take his life twice during middle school, Sang Jin suffered from severe headaches on a monthly basis. But sadly, this would never be investigated any further, and instead he was just given pain relief medication. Although not a direct translation, Sang Jin claims that ever since those dark days in middle school, he had struggled to find any sort of meaning in his life. And his feeling of hopelessness seemed to extend into his everyday behaviour too. Starting from a very young age, he was convicted or imprisoned a total of eight times, which included imprisonment for skipping mandatory training for military reservists. Now, I've mentioned this in previous cases, and you may already be aware, but in South Korea, it is mandatory for young men to serve in the military for 18 months before they are 28 years old. Jang Sin elected to ignore this role, for which he was eventually fined 1.5 million won, the equivalent of $1,200 or £1,000. After graduating from high school, he worked as an employee at a bar and then in an office. He did eventually join the military mostly against his will, but was eventually discharged as an army sergeant in the year 2002. It is at this point in his life that he moved over to Seoul, perhaps to find his soul. However, shitty pun aside, things never improved after this. Swinging from dead-end job to dead-end job, he eventually settled into working at a restaurant in Gangnam Do. But this didn't last forever, as after misconduct in the workplace, he was fired in April 2008. His unemployment left him in a severely difficult monetary situation. He was already under financial pressure, thanks to unpaid college tuition fees, mobile phone bills, and military fines. As you can likely imagine, this was the main reason why Sang Jin lived in Agosawan. I mean, put short, he was completely broke. And to add to the financial burden was an already concerning state of mental health. Sang Jin's room was, put bluntly, a complete mess, and anyone who briefly peeked inside his room was very perplexed by his behaviour. Dozens of large dolls were piled up to the back of his room, and next to his mattress, dozens of alien dolls were arranged by colour and in rows of five. On the other side of the room, rolls of toilet paper had stacked up almost to the ceiling, and located right next to it, trash had piled up almost to the same height. Although these details were strange to say the least, they weren't necessarily dangerous behaviour. However, if you looked at his diaries, they would tell an entirely different story. Going as far back as the year 2005, Sang Jin's diaries were filled with pessimism about himself and hatred of the world. From what has been released to the public, several of his entries included the following information. One entry read, If I had the choice between winning the lottery or having the chance to totally destroy Earth, I would pick the latter. Another said, I should have never been born. I was wrong from the very beginning. There is nothing in my body or brain that is right. I hate people. It's time to end it now. In 2006, he wrote, Now, until the moment of my last breath, there is only a desperate struggle. Some other excerpts taken before 2008 are a little more menacing. This society is dizzying. My country has abandoned me. There is only a desperate struggle for me, and until the moment my last breath stops, I will only see evil. I don't like people. I don't like how they look at me. I was born by accident. I am a bad seed. For that, I know it's time for me to end it all. I am ready to sacrifice my body without hesitation, just so my blood can unnerve you, even if just for a moment. I will gladly sacrifice myself for all of the poor people on this wretched earth. That will be the last highlights of my life. Let's finish this nicely, like the end of a movie. Through his diary entries, which were unknown to the rest of the world at the time, Sang Jin was furious with the cards life had dealt him thus far. The deranged man believed that the world was ignoring him, and that he was destined to remain poor not by choice. He held a vast amount of disdain for anyone who had money, and increasingly despised the many wealthy people that lived around him. Reading back as far as 2005, there were hints that Sang Jin wanted to claim revenge on the wealthy, and this idea became a lot more apparent when he watched one particular movie. I usually don't like horror and action movies, but today I saw a Korean movie called A Bittersweet Life. And you know what? I thought the main character was very cool. 
Now, A Bittersweet Life is a movie about a loyal enforcer who is asked by his mobster boss to shadow his girlfriend. The protagonist develops feelings, and after things go south, he kills his boss and the boss's gangsters in revenge. The main character dies at the end of the film, forever seen as a complex man who was never understood by the world. But probably the most important part to this film, and more specifically to Sang Jin, this character successfully claimed his revenge even if other people didn't understand. Following on from Sang Jin's diary, his next words were, and so it is time I prepared for the crime. The gossu one he lived in was above a restaurant on the edge of Gangnam's district, and consisted of 85 tiny rooms on the third and fourth floors of an otherwise commercial building. All rooms were rented on a monthly basis, and were generally used by low-income people living alone. And in the month of October 2008, 69 of those rooms were inhabited. Like most Goss 1 buildings, all bedrooms were parallel to each other, with a hallway in between two rows. All bedrooms were only 2x2 two two meters, and with the hallway being only 1 meter wide, the entire place felt like a complex labyrinth. Receipt records show that Sang Jin had a variety of items already at his disposal, including a long knife, two other knives, a gas gun, and a head lantern. And although all of these items were likely bought without any malicious intent, they were sadly all coming together for one very vicious plan. Now, Sang Jin's plans were ghastly, morbid even, but to be honest with you, they didn't make much sense. Although his main objective was initially to seek revenge on the wealthy, his new victims were actually quite the opposite and in fact, they were in the exact same position he was. And on October the 20th, 2008, his wicked scheme would finally come to light, horrifying the entire country of South Korea. October 20th, 2008. It was a Monday, 8.15 in the morning, and Seoul was preparing for another typical workday. But inside the Gosuan of Gangnam's Non Yong Dong, a harrowing event was about to unfold. Today was the day that Jong Sang Jin claimed his so-called revenge, and at 8.16am he began this by pouring gasoline onto his bed before setting it ablaze. As the flames engulfed the bed and the fire began to spread, smoke bellowed into the hallway, filling the densely packed collection of bedrooms in all directions. Other residents began to scream and shout for help, and that is when Sang Jin emerged from his room. Dressed all in black, he wore goggles and a headlamp for visibility, with a balaclava to hide his face. Armed with a sashimi knife, two further knives strapped to his legs, and a tear gas gun in his belt holster, he began to attack anyone who came his way. Some of the residents who had woken up to this commotion managed to escape via the elevator. Others ran down the stairs, while some made their way to a veranda, jumping to escape from as high as the fourth floor. As more guests ran out into the hallway located near Sang Jin's room, one by one, they were met with the armed and violent man. And tragically, five residents found their demise at the end of his knives. As the fire began to rip through the Gosawan, police and firefighters arrived at the scene, but the flames had grown too large to overcome, and most of the building was now at the mercy of the inferno. But finally, after 30 minutes of destruction, a team of just over 100 firefighters were able to overcome the flames. It was just over one hour since he set the fire at 9.20am that firefighters breached his room. Initially thought to be another victim, Sang Jin was rescued and taken out to safety. The man was found huddled up in his closet. But when police noticed his rather peculiar behaviour, officers couldn't help but question him at the scene. It was at this point that everything came to light, because Sang Jin made no effort to hide his crimes. And to everyone's surprise, he had confessed to what he had done almost instantly. Moving forward, the man was arrested and taken to Gangnam Police Station immediately, where he was charged with both homicide and arson. Though, to begin with, nobody knew how many casualties there would be, as tragically, there were several people still in critical condition. Police officers confiscated various items from Sang Jin, including a black ski hat, a black mask, a headlamp, a gas-propelled pistol with loaded bullets, a leather belt with a holster, two fruit knives, one sashimi knife, two pistol type lighters, and two barrels of gasoline. And after searching what was left of his bedroom, investigators were able to recover his diaries, which of course left many glaring clues about his motive. The aftermath of his actions were devastating, and a huge struggle for officers to take in. Walls and doors were scorched, cladding from the ceiling had disintegrated, and electric wiring hung from the beams of above. 
Paint from the walls had peeled back like dried skin from an orange, and rubble lay burnt and indistinguishable on the floor. Bedding and items were mangled beyond recognition, and a lone fire extinguisher remained unused in a corner. Lockers had been flung open in a hurry, with a small mountain of shoes in front of it, and sadly, some of those shoes would never again find their owners. Blood covered the reception room's phone, paperwork untouched as if nothing was wrong, and broken windows highlighted the sheer desperation in people trying to escape. This really was a lot to take in for investigators. Sadly, as the days passed, it was revealed that Sang Jin had claimed the lives of six innocent people. Five had died through fatal injuries by his knife while one had fallen to her death. Seven more victims were seriously injured, with three in critical condition, and later on it was learned that three of his deceased victims were Chinese citizens. Amongst the victims were Seo Jin, who was 20 years old, Min Dae Jia was 60, Li Wo Jia, 50, Zhou Young Jia, 53, Kim Yang Sion, 45, and Park Jong Suk, 52. It was noted that Li Wol Jia, who was a Korean Chinese woman, had suffered burns all over her body after being stabbed 30 times with a knife. This included many stab wounds to her chest and her stomach. Everyone involved in this incident was absolutely traumatized, and one man who managed to survive the attack described his encounter with Sang Jin as the following. A black object suddenly appeared out of the thick black smoke, and began to attack other people in the Gosawan. Out of fear, I couldn't move my feet. I locked my door and even thought of breaking the window, jumping down if I saw any sign of the door opening. I opened the door and tried to pick up a fire extinguisher, but when I turned my head, I saw a man dressed in all black amongst the smoke. It was almost like a movie, an illusion. It felt like a professional terrorist was put in the Gosawan. It was as if a character out of an ambush or a war movie had suddenly appeared. Unfortunately, this incident reignited awful memories of previous massacres, as sadly, Korea had experienced one or two in recent years. In 2003, a 56-year-old man ignited a subway train in the southern city of Daegu with a canister full of gasoline. The blaze engulfed the entire train, leaving 198 people dead and 147 injured. Their neighbouring country, Japan, had also been struck by a series of stabbings and massacres too. As some of you will remember in my case covering Tomohiro Kato, seven people were killed in Akihabara when a man slammed a truck into a crowd of shoppers, before taking a knife to anyone standing by. Moving into the legal proceedings of this case, Sang Jin claimed that he no longer had any desire to live anymore, as now everyone would look down upon him. I mean, I have no idea what this guy was expecting, because yeah, he's kind of stating the bloody obvious here. Disturbingly, over the weeks it also became clear that Sang Jin held no remorse or guilt for his actions. He always seemed to focus on himself, and instead, during his interrogation, he claimed that he'd been persecuted since his childhood. He would also tell officers that, since trying to take his own life, he often suffered from severe headaches and could never find a reason why. Investigators initially claimed that Sang Jin had no debilitating disease or mental illness, highlighting that the most apparent health issue was a mild case of varicose veins. Now I'm not entirely sure what you would say about this, but I wouldn't say varicose veins are well known for their massacre-inducing side effects. However, initial psychologists did admit that he could have had surgery to help alleviate the infrequent severe headaches, but unfortunately he did not have access to 3 million won required for this surgery, the equivalent of $2400 or £2,000. Prosecutors claimed that he was motivated by a combination of psychological distress, financial troubles, and influence from the movie A Bittersweet Life. Sang Jin was ordered to undergo a thorough mental evaluation for one month before his trial, but this would not yield any sort of medical response or excuse that he was hoping for. Psychologists concluded that he knew the content and characteristics of the crime, and committed it with intent and had planned it for a very long period of time. However, they further concluded that emotional and mental health issues were present during his childhood. This included borderline personality disorder, known as BPD, and dysthymia. Borderline personality disorder is a condition that affects how you think, feel, and interact with other people. Symptoms of BPD include being emotionally unstable, having upsetting or intrusive thoughts, and acting without thinking. Dysthymia is a long-lasting form of depression which lasts for at least two years. Common symptoms include poor appetite, 
relationships, insomnia, low energy, low self-esteem, and hopelessness. Now, both of these conditions perfectly described Sang Jin. He claimed to have had a neglectful childhood, was emotionally unstable, had low self-esteem, and experienced relentless hopelessness. Feelings of alienation and inferiority, resentment towards his parents, and multiple attempts to take his own life due to social dissatisfaction all played into these conditions. However, schizophrenia and psychotic depression were considered not to be present. They further concluded that, although he did suffer from chronic depression, he was fully aware of his actions. It was also revealed that he had tried to take his own life five times throughout the years, including poisoning himself in the first year of middle school and overdosing on sleeping pills after military service in March 2003. But investigations concluded that, based on a psychological evaluation, he fully understood his actions and was therefore responsible for his crimes. His trial began in April 2009, and mental health notes aside, nothing surprising came out of the court. Sang Jin eventually showed remorse for his actions, which he often repeated the same statement over and over again. I was wrong, I'm reflecting on my actions, and I regret them a lot. On May the 12th, 2009, Jong Sang Jin was found guilty for six counts of premeditated murder. Due to his coherence, he was found to be fully accountable for his actions, and with South Korea still imposing the death sentence, that is exactly what he received. However, despite South Korea retaining the death penalty, it is classified as an abolitionist in practice country, meaning the death penalty has not actually been executed since 1997. This means that, to this day, Sang Jin still remains alive behind bars. Though, to be honest, that is probably a much harder sentence for him, given his ongoing expression of wanting to die just after his crimes took place. Following a sentence, the family and friends of his six victims were very pleased with the result, and thankfully it seemed to spark a change in Goswan regulations too. The Korea Goswan Association estimates there's around 4,000 active Goswan in Seoul, and another 2,000 nationally. Now of course, they can be a very good thing, because according to government data, the number of homeless people in Seoul has dropped to below 3,000. Compare that to 10 million residents, and that is an absolutely staggering achievement, if you think about it and has likely helped many vulnerable people off the streets. However, that is not to say that Goswan don't come without their fair share of caveats and problems. The National Emergency Management Agency estimates there's currently around 110,000 residents in Goswan across Seoul, with a nationwide estimate of around 200,000. But unless these buildings are held to satisfactory safety standards, all of these people are at risk. In the year 2002, which was still six years before Sangjin's violent actions, discussions around the Goswan Safety Management Standards Act were held at a governmental level. However, sadly, no changes in regulations were made. The Ministry of Health and Welfare took another look into Goswan standards in 2007, but again, this was eventually scrapped due to government resources. It was only on November the 30th, 2008, which just so happened to be six weeks after Sang Jin's crime, that the National Emergency Management Agency announced it would make revisions to the Special Act of Safety Management of multi-used establishments. In these revisions, it was announced that the width of all corridors in Goswan must be extended from 90 centimeters to 120. These changes had to be made within a year, and any Goswan establishment unable to meet these demands must be closed immediately. The NEM agency also enforced regulations to make sprinkler systems compulsory, and all exit signs must be illuminated. And although these regulations steer South Korea's safety standards in the right direction, it is all too late for the victims of this tragedy. It is a real shame to say this, but unfortunately there isn't much known about them or the lives they had either. Apparently, Seo Jin was the sister to a semi-famous football player, and Lee Walger was a mother who had migrated to South Korea to bring money back home to her son in China. Regrettably, it is a real shame I can't bring more information in their remembrance. Fifteen years have passed since Gangnam's Gosawon massacre, fifteen years since these victims left behind six families and hundreds of friends collectively, and I do hope that, throughout all these years, they have collectively found peace. And that comes to the very end of our case today, folks, which means I'm wrapping this one up here. Again, I'm very sorry I couldn't bring any more to the victims of this story. So, what do you think about this story? It touches quite a few interesting topics, like wealth and the wealth divide, but also some psychological problems when Sang Jin was a child. I'd love to know more of what you think below. As you can likely see, I'm diving back into international cases, so tell me what you think about that below. 
and if you have any suggestions, please let me know too. As always, folks, if you found this case interesting, then remember to like the video and subscribe if you haven't yet. It really does help the channel out. Until we see each other again, which I promise won't be that long, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye. You haven't said hi to the camera for a while. You wanna say hi to it? What's up here? Look up here. There are hundreds of thousands of people who know you, and you have no idea. That head is pretty empty, isn't it? Yeah. Empty but happy, that's the way I wanna live.